Oh yes, and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV with myself, Ger Brown, and Gary Spain here today as we continue to look back on different Ireland managers' reigns. Now it's the turn of Mick McCarthy's first spell and Brian Kerr. And one of the players to play under both managers was, of course, Matt Holland, who has, we are delighted to have with us today. Matt, great to have you back on the channel. No, thank you for having me on. Looking forward to it. So, Gary, Mick McCarthy took over from Jack Charlton in the spring of 96. And I suppose his first two campaigns are quite an interesting one in Irish football. They're kind of almost nearly the forgotten um, era of Irish football because they're between us make, failing to make um, major tournaments. But there was seen the time of transition, but we were quite unlucky not to make a couple of tournaments during that time. Yeah, I think it was definitely a time of transition, Ger, and it was a it, Jack was a very tough act to follow. He was he's our greatest ever manager, I think, without doubt. Um, a lot of players had retired as well, and but also looking back with hindsight, you had the likes of Robbie Keane, Damien Duff, etc., coming through. So it was a, a new generation. Yeah, I, I don't know if we were unlucky. It's hard to, I suppose. Yeah, we, we, we actually, because of the success, we had a, a good seeding and a great draw for France 98. I suppose a lot of the fans, we were kind of expecting a bit of a decline, but um, the campaign was a bit hit and miss, some disappointing results. And then we pulled it around with a couple of great wins in Lithuania and Iceland. Um, bit unlucky to lose to Romania, actually, away from home, uh, missed penalty. Um, came down to play off with Belgium. And I, I suppose their winning goal shouldn't have been allowed. It was actually a throw into us. But I, I think over the two games, in fairness, I think the better team won. And uh, I suppose, and even at that campaign, I think Ray Houghton retired and all after that one. Um, it was very much, uh, there was a friendly in the Czech Republic in 98 when I think we'd had something like five or six new caps. And that was the time that, that Robbie, et cetera, and, and Damien came in. And it very much changed the squad. Um, yeah, the campaign, the, the one I the, what I regret, and certainly as a fan, I, 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 and I suppose Matt was only involved at the end, was the campaign for Euro 2000 because uh, we actually played really well in that in that campaign, and that's one I think we were certainly, I suppose, unlucky is is one term for it, but maybe in other terms we we perhaps threw it away. Uh, some great performances. We started off with a, a fantastic home win over Croatia, who had just finished third. They got the bronze medal in the 98 World Cup. And a, a really quality side came to Dublin in September, and we beat them 2-0. We were 2-0 up after about 15, 16 minutes. Um, we're really good at home. I think we won every home game in that campaign. A, a great win at home to what was then Yugoslavia. Um, undone by a couple of Late goals, bit unlucky actually to lose lose in Belgrade. Um, beaten in the ninety third minute in in Zagreb by Croatia, and it all came down to which actually was Matt's first cap. It was needing to beat Macedonia in Skopje to qualify, and which I think we should have been capable of doing at the time. Particularly, I think they were short seven or eight or eight players and. Uh, as people know, unfortunately, we were one nil up. Probably should have been a lot further ahead, and got caught with an absolute sickening, sickening goal by Goran Stravetsky from a corner, about the ninety second, ninety third minute, more or less the last touch of, touch of the game. And I'd, I'd love to get Matt's thoughts on that. I know you, 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 that was his first cap, so he was quite young. And yeah, it was. It, well, yeah, it's uh, horrible memories, to be honest. I know it's, it should be a one you really enjoy when you get your first cap, um, but for it to be such a, a knockout blow, it was it was one of the most um, depressing dressing rooms I've ever been in. I'd actually been involved in a couple of games just before. Um, I was in the squad, I think, for the game in in Malta and and in Croatia, um, but I hadn't got on the pitch. And then um, you know, one nil up, Mick was looking to protect the the uh the lead brought me on with about 10 minutes to go and obviously it's it's a brilliant moment you get your first cap uh and and you're very proud to do that but then of course when they equalized and i think it was something like the 94th minute something ridiculous like that um you know i felt helpless really because i was i think i was on the edge of the box sort of doing my job on the edge of the box and you, you see it hit the back of the net and i think 
I think even in Mick's book, actually, he, he wrote, I wonder what Matt Holland must have been thinking, you know, coming on with 10 minutes to go for your debut. And of course, it, it's such a crushing blow when you, you don't win the game. Um, what must I have been thinking? Well, it, it felt pretty bad. Um, obviously, you yeah. know, I, I, there was no sort of personal responsibility. It wasn't my fault. You know, the, the goal wasn't my, you know, my mistake particularly, but even so you come on and, and when that happens, it's, it's pretty depressing. And the dressing room was, you know, wow. Uh, shouting, screaming, uh, um, there was tears. It was everything. It was, it was like, wow, this is, this is what I've come into. It was, it was pretty, yeah, pretty surreal really for your first cap. Yeah, that goal for Macedonia costing us an automatic place in Euro 2000. It meant for the third campaign in a row, we had to go into a playoff. We were drawn against Turkey. Robbie Keane put us 1 0 up at Lansdowne. We didn't give away a penalty, drew one all. Second leg, controversial in so many ways. The game wasn't televised in Ireland. Obviously, the bus stop with Tony Cascarino after the game. But a 0 0 draw meant we missed out on away goals. And overall, Gary, given the balance of play that night, we couldn't really argue with Turkey, really were the better team, and we created very little. Yeah, so the I think I share Matt's. I mean, the fans were just as devastated in Skopje. Just going back to that briefly because I I remember our we were in the airport virtually all night afterwards. Flights were delayed. Just it was just a horrible. It's actually the worst moment uh, as a fan of the Irish team that I can that I can remember. The most heartbreaking because we were just so sure we we're going to qualify. Yeah, I think the playoffs were always. We're always going to be a long shot after that. Turkey were pretty good at the time. Um, we did really well. Got, went ahead in the home game, as you say, Ger, uh, Robbie, late on. I think had we held on and won 1-0, I mean, in a two-legged tie with away goals, I think 1-0 at home is always a great result. And unfortunately, they got the disputed penalty. That's, at least that, that's my view of it anyway. It, it was. It was a, he was a handball against Lee Carsley, but he was very close to it. And uh, maybe with VAR, we might have got away with it in those days. Going to Bursa uh, was always going to be incredibly difficult. Um, they're really, it's a small stadium. They were only about 18, I think 18 or 20,000. I have to check at the game, and there was only about a couple of hundred Irish fans there. But um, it, was, um, it was a fantastic atmosphere. Um, Certainly under no threat or anything like that, but really passionate and very noisy for the home side. And yeah, it finished nil nil. I don't think we ever really threatened to score. I, I unfortunately, yeah, I think uh, the better team did qualify for Euro two thousand out of that playoff, but uh, Skopje was the one that got away. Matt, if the dressing wasn't in a great place after Skopje, I imagine it still wasn't much better after that Turkey game. Do you know, I was I wasn't involved. I, I had an injury, I think, and um, and wasn't in the squad for those two games. I, I missed those two games against Turkey. Um, so having been in the squad for a sort of two or three matches, uh, and then of course um, getting to the playoff against Turkey, not being involved in that, that was um, a big blow for me, really, and, and missing out on that. Um, so yeah, I, I I wasn't in the dressing room, so I couldn't tell you too much about that. Um, I didn't really come to prominence until the following um, summer, really, uh, because I was then uh, in the US Cup, and that's when I, I sort of started getting into the team as well. So, um, yeah, I missed out on that on that match against Turkey. So that was a, a bit of a blow for me, having just got into the squad as well. You mentioned that US Cup in the summer of 2000. It was quite an interesting and eventful time in your life because just about a week before that, oh, yeah. you completed one dream of yours to become a Premier League player, part of the Ipswich team, the Bet Barnsley, to win the playoff final 4 2. You could have been forgiven and think, I'm going to enjoy myself and lift this all up, but you took the brave decision to go to that tournament and it really did put you in your mindset, Mick McCarthy. Well, I, I, oh, there's no question I was going to go. Um... To, to, to the the US Cup, um, yeah, we we just as you say we we'd won the playoffs, and I think we had a bit. Uh, so that was on the the Monday, it was a bank holiday Monday, and then I think on the Tuesday we had a civic reception in Ipswich, sort of a, a big celebration, and there was a friendly um, just before we went in, in um, Dublin. I think it was against Scotland, um, which I which I missed um, because of the the celebrations after the game, and I think uh, well he wouldn't have played me anyway because the game would come pretty quickly after that as well. Um, and then um, flew straight into Dublin, and and then off to off to America. Um, but there was no question I was going to miss that. There was a lot of players missing from that squad. You know, 
end of season tournament like that, you're bound to get a few pull outs and a few clubs wanting their players to rest at the end of a long season. And that's exactly what happened. So it was a good opportunity for me. And I actually played all three games and, and 90 minutes in all the three games as well. So that was really my platform, I think, for um, a chance to get into the side and and for Mick to see what I could do uh, and be a, around the group as well for a, a period of time, you know, get to know the lads, get to know, you know, the way things work, um, get to know um, the management, the, the the coaching staff. And, and so it was a really good period for me. And, I, you know, I, I know it came at the end of a long season, um, but it was absolutely no chance of me missing that. Yeah, that then led us up to the 2002 World Cup qualifying campaign. Gary mentioned for earlier campaigns, good seed and helped us. Because we now failed to miss a, make a couple of tournaments, we dropped to third seed and we landed ourselves in a group of debt with Portugal and Holland. Even though the team was kind of progressing and was coming along nicely, Gary mentioned it in the Euro 2000 qualifying campaign, because now the fact we've missed out in three tournaments in a row, lost in three playoffs, did like the older players more so than yourself because you were a new player feel that there was a lot of pressure? Like, right, we really have to get to this tournament, despite how difficult a group it was. Uh, I don't think they, they felt there was any any more pressure. I think there's you always put pressure on yourselves. You know, there's always that um, personal pressure that you put on yourself to, to perform and play at a level and try and get to tournaments. Um, so I don't think there was any any extra pressure. Um, obviously, it was a, a difficult group. And um, when you've got your, your first two games uh, against Holland and Portugal away, it, it doesn't get much much more difficult than that either. So you want to get off to a good start. Um, and I th again, I missed the Holland game. I, I picked up a knock and, and missed the Holland game. But the stories about the you know the dressing room after the game after being ahead in it and Roy just losing the plot and not being happy i think that sets the tone really you know when you, when you go away to somewhere like holland and quality players that they've got uh, and you're disappointed to come away with a draw i think that that really sets the tone and it, and it, a group was building you know we talked earlier about some of the players that were coming through shade given had come through under mick um kevin kilban had come through under mick um, obviously, Robbie, Damien, there was a lot of younger players coming through as well and pushing, you know, I suppose some of the senior players along. Um, but yeah, I think when you when you go away to Holland and you're disappointed to, to only draw the game, I think that that sets you off to a to a great start of a campaign. Yeah, that Holland game in Amsterdam, Gary, everyone remembers Jason McAteer's goal in the reverse picture lands down road. But his goal that night in Amsterdam to put us tuning up was probably one of the best goals we've ever seen from an Irish team. Some lovely, lovely football. And in general, we played some great football that night and really should have won the game. We, we should have been out of sight before Holland got back into the match. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. And I, I can I can see the disappointment. We we did play really well. We were tuning up. And uh but I mean and and the, the Dutch were a really quality side. I mean, they'd have been semi-finalists in, in 98 in the World Cup. Um they, they they came right back at us. They came back to two two, and I think there was still about eight or nine minutes to go, and we were we were probably hanging on. We were probably lucky to draw in the end. But yeah, but over the the balance of ninety minutes, um, we probably should have won the game. We could have lost the game, but it was. I can see both sides of it. It was it was a great result, but you're kind of feeling you go two nil up away from home against. A, a, a top a top side, I mean, which was unbelievable, and then I suppose not to win it, and uh, and then going on to Portugal, it, it looked it was a really awful, it was an awful draw. Okay, we were third seeds, but we got two of the best, two of the worst teams we could have got, but two of the best teams in the world. Um, Lisbon, I I don't think we played as well. Um, uh, my memory of it, I'm sure Matt's is as well. I, I was behind the other goal, but uh, Matt. We we were we were given a bit of a chasing. We were hanging on for nil nil. I think it was Figo put them ahead deservedly in the second half. We thought, look, this is it. And I think it's Matt's first international goal, but what a strike um, from outside the area! Brilliant finish with about fifteen minutes to go. And I'd, I'd love to hear his views <laughs> on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it, we were getting a bit of a chasing, and I think that was one of the reasons why Mick made the change at half time as well, bringing me on. Um, because he wanted an extra body in midfield because that was an area where they were starting to get on top, found, finding a bit of room. The way they play, you know, they they some of the forwards drop into little spaces and Figo was getting on the ball and um, uh, it, we, we were under a lot of pressure in the game. Um, so half-time, the message really from Mick was to just go in and, and sit, let 
I think Roy and Kins go and press the ball if they could. Um, but then I could sort of pick up maybe the centre forward that came into those little spaces or, um, I mean, he, mixed words were just, just keep an eye on Figo as well, which is not an easy thing to do either. Someone as, as good as him um, and don't venture too far forward. That was his exact, exact words. And um, obviously we went a goal behind and then you have to try and do something to try and get back into the game. And I, I remember picking the ball up off Roy and I was still a long way out, probably 35, 40 yards. And, and all of a sudden everyone sort of, backed off I, I, my, my thought was have a touch and and maybe try and deliver it into the box put a cross into the box and um and see what happens but actually it just started to open up so I, I sort of had another touch and took it forward another couple of yards and took it forward again another couple of yards and then you're thinking well now I'm sort of within shooting distance so why not have a crack and that you know something I I pride myself on really being able to sort of strike a ball from outside the box and you know <laughs> the there's no real precision in it. It's not like you're aiming for that particular part of the goal. You put your foot through it and, and you know, you think hit the target and, um, and, and make the goalkeeper make a save. Fortunately for me, it flew past him and into the back of the net. And, you know, the rest is history. It's, um, uh, it's funny, actually, because after the game, Mick came onto the pitch and he put his arm around me and he said, what did I say to you at halftime? He said, I told you not to venture too far forward. And then he sort of had a little smirk on his face. And um, so that was it. That was, you know, me off and running, really, I think, in a, in an island shirt. It, it was um, a big goal, a big moment. Um, and they dropped me for the next game against Estonia at home. Couldn't believe it. Yeah, but it's a cracking goal to get you up and running in a green shirt. As you mentioned, that Estonia game, that starts a nice run of fixtures after them two tricky away fixtures. We won all them games come to be Estonia at home, Cyprus away, Andorra both home and away, Estonia away. And you scored a couple of goals as well in those games. Both games. Uh, hot, uh, hot, hot, against. Against. Yeah, uh, scored, scored uh, in Andorra. Um, scored a third in Andorra. Uh we had to be patient in that game, actually. It took us a little while to break break the deadlock in that one. You know, for, for having had a lot of the ball, it was, um, it, 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 they, were, they were sort of difficult to break down. I think it might be an Ian Hart penalty that the opener uh, against them. And then, and then obviously, we, um, I think Kev scored and I, I got the third as well. So, um, yeah, that was that was good. And the, the Estonia one actually was a really good strike. It, it was as clean a strike as, as I've ever hit, to be honest. Um, it came at me quite quickly. Um, and that was right at the end of the season. I think Roy was missing as well. So I think it was me and Kins in midfield um, that night, uh, that day even, I think, in, in Estonia, um, right at the back end of the season. And and, um, and when it, I think Richard Dunn had put us one ahead. And then and then when the ball came to me on the edge of the box, I just it was a snapshot. But I mean, it was past the keeper before he even knew. And it, it flew off the foot. It was just a, a, a really, really clean strike. Um probably one of the cleanest I've ever hit in my career. Uh, I really enjoyed that goal. It was, um, it was one of my favorite, one of my favorite strikes. And, and obviously it, it, it was another important one really just to make sure that we got the three points and got the job done because without Roy as well, it was, it was um, people sort of saying that might've been a potential banana skin. So we, we, um, we managed to get the three points, which was good. And that says up perfectly then for Holland to home in September, 2001, Gary went into that game four points ahead of them. It was the do or die game for the playoff and of course we all know what happened with Jason McAteer scoring the goal a brilliant result considering Gary Kelly got sent off midway through the second half but we do have to be small but thank for that uh, Patrick Clyver didn't have his shooting boots on that yeah Joe I'll just go back because it was another crucial game at home to Portugal in uh, in the 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 summer of, of, of 2001, because the, the way the group had panned out, although we got two fantastic uh, points away and we'd done the business against Estonia, Andorra and Cyprus, very good win in Cyprus as well. There were no mugs at that stage. Um, so we had, we'd drawn at home to Portugal. Uh, again, they were a really good side. We did take the lead, but again, they, they were well worth the point. Uh, it set up the Dutch game, as you say, and it was, we needed a draw to be absolutely sure of at least the playoff probably portugal were going to were going to go on and win the group at that stage it's funny actually because just going back going through that portugal game um a lot of people mention the holland match and say roy's tackle on over mars and roy's performance against holland when we beat them one nil i actually think his best performance came against portugal in that qualifying um group i thought he was absolutely outstanding at, at lansdowne in that game i thought that was um that was maybe even his best shirt 
uh, best performance in an Ireland shirt. I thought he was he was amazing, you know. And and people point to that Overmars tackle early on in the in the in the Dutch game when he puts him six foot in the air and the crowd get up and we're all we're all rocking. Um, but actually, I thought against Portugal it, it, that was his best performance. Yeah, I'd actually agree with that, and I think probably and maybe the point as well is Roy played really well against Portugal, and maybe a lot of other players had an off day. Whereas against the Dutch, it was a great team performance. And uh, we played really well in that game, yeah, even when down to 10 men. And, uh, yeah, we had to ride our luck. Great goal by J by Jason McAteer. Um, we definitely rode our luck a bit. Um, an amazing decision, I think, by, was, was it Louis van Hal was the manager to take off the two wingers and bring on two strikers. I, I think that actually benefited us. They, they had four, I think, who they, Van Nistelrooy, Hasselbank, Kluivert, uh, I think they're four quality strikers on the pitch, but sometimes you've just got too many, too many people in the middle and nobody to supply the supply the ball to them. Yeah, the the Dutch game was an, an amazing atmosphere in Lansdowne Road as well. A great day, a great win. We actually only needed a draw, but the win absolutely guaranteed the the playoff and and gave us a chance that was I don't think was ever really going to happen. I think Portugal were going to do the business. And go on and, and win the group. Um, everyone in the group was actually good at taking care of Estonia, Cyprus, Andorra, etc. And uh, it set up the the playoff with Iran. Yeah, because we did win our last game against Cyprus 4-0, but Portugal gave Estonia a good hide in the home as well, so they topped the group on goal difference. And it was Iran in the playoff seen as a favourable draw. Two nil up. Uh, from the first leg at Lansdowne Road, Ian Hart with a penalty, Robbie Keane with a great strike from the edge of the box. We had Shea Gibbs tank him in a couple of good saves to make sure that we had a good lead going to the return leg and around. A very, very hostile atmosphere, but I thought we handled it quite well that night, Matt. Yeah, I thought actually we, we, we did a bit better away from home defensively than we did at home. I think there was a an urgency at home to try and get a few goals ahead if we possibly could. Um, and with doing so, we did leave a few gaps at the back. And you're right, we were indebted to Shea. I thought he was brilliant in, in that first game. Um, away from home, actually, I thought we, we set up really well to frustrate, um, not give them too many chances. And they had one or two moments. Of course they did. Uh, and again, Shea was in top form. Um, but I think actually we did handle it pretty well. We got When we got there, I mean, I remember the, the stadium being absolutely full when we arrived. And apparently they'd been in sort of four or five hours before the actual kickoff time. And they were all praying and there was a, there was a really, really fiery atmosphere. Uh, when we came out of the tunnel, there was firecrackers. There was you know all sorts of things being thrown at us. Um, and so it was quite an intimidating. It was probably the most intimidating atmosphere I, I can ever recall playing in. Um, and and um, once we got the job done, that was that was a pretty good feeling. I know they scored late on, but we, we were we were pretty much home and hosed by then anyway. Um, and then the, the dressing room, we had a few celebrations. Um, and when we when we came out actually of the ground and we're dr we're driving um, on the bus back to the hotel, I mean there was smashed up cars. There was all sorts of stuff because they, they were almost rioting at the fact that they hadn't, they hadn't got back into it and hadn't qualified for the world cup. It was, it was it, it, quite an intense atmosphere. Um, but as I say, I think we actually dealt with it better away from home than we did perhaps at home. At home, there was a, a bit of an expectancy about it away. It was more of a com controlled, I think composed display defensively anyway. Just on that campaign as a whole in general, like Roy Keane gets a lot of plaudits for his performance in midfield. I think that's a little bit unharsh on yourself and Mark Kinsa because I thought overall in midfield, everyone chipped in and you all looked so comfortable. Like you got three goals, Mark chipped in with a couple of goals. Like in midfield, I just thought in general, the whole three of you just looked so dominant. I, I think to be honest, when, when you're going through a campaign, it, it's important that everyone performs. I think that's that's the key, and that's the, that's you know the reason why you have a squad and, and why it's it's so important at certain parts in that in that um, qualifying that you have people stand up and be counted when you need them. You know you're going to have suspensions, you're going to have injuries, you're going to have people miss out, you're going to have people who are out of form, club level, and perhaps not. Although oh, having said that, Mick was very loyal actually with the, with his team selections. You know it wasn't something that he was too affected by what you were doing at club level. You know he he judged you pretty much on what you'd done for him in an Ireland shirt as well. And that's why I had to be patient a bit as well, because, you know, Roy and Kins have been brilliant. And and so at times I had to sort of, you know, be a little bit patient, bite my tongue and, and you know, fight my way into the team. 
in a couple of games, you know, that Portugal away, we played all three of us in midfield. Um, Stonia away, I think Roy had an injury. So myself and Kins played in there. Um, uh, I think Kins missed out in Andorra maybe. And, you know, there was, so there was, or Cyprus. I, so the, throughout that campaign, you all have to chip in and you all have to contribute. And when you get the call, you have to, you have to perform. And, um, and when you've got so much quality there as well, you had Lee Carsey as well, of course, you know, you're being pushed. You, you have to sort of play well to, to stay in the team. So, um, yeah, I think it's it's good when you've got such competition. Gary, it would be fair to say that qualifying campaign for 2002 World Cup is the last time Lansdowne Road or the Aviva is now within a real fortress. Because like under Mick McCarthy's first spell, we never lost any home qualifier until his last one against Switzerland. And since then, like with the exception of beating Germany and then Bosnia in the playoff for your 2016, I can't think of any big victories we've had at home. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was, I suppose, very much, it very much was a fortress and, and the atmosphere was superb as well. Uh, it, it, I think the atmosphere in that Germany game was really special as well, but it reminded me of the Dutch game. But yeah, we were difficult. I think what was mixed defeat, I think beaten by Thierry Henry in France, actually, in, in 2005, we'd probably come on to that. But yeah, otherwise we were we were really good at home. But we were very good away as well. I mean, we, we went through that campaign. Uh, we went through it unbeaten, apart from that last-minute goal in Iran when the game was effectively won. Um, and it was. I mean, we were in total control, actually. We probably didn't deserve to lose that match even, not not that it mattered really in the end. So I think home and away, th that campaign was really impressive, and particularly given the, the quality of the sides. We, I mean... The Dutch and Port, I can't stress how good they were at the time. And uh, to put that Dutch team out of the World Cup was was really special. The team that got to the semi-finals in, um, in 2002 and with all the quality players they had. So, yeah, it was. I mean, Lansdowne Road, the, the, att the attendances were actually quite small in those days because it was limited with the all-seater and the temporary seats. So I think you could only get 34, 35, 36,000, something like that. But uh, what a noise and, and what an atmosphere at the time. That campaign as well as uh, an away trip back to back to Cyprus and Andorra and Barcelona. Is that the best ever away trip, Gary, with plenty of sunshine? Oh, <laughs> we actually got fed up of um, I've gone to Cyprus at this stage. I don't know about sunshine and away trips. Um, probably the best ones are the ones you win and get get, get good wins on, you know. Certainly would have been a dream one, certainly to make a good holiday out of And I say a lot of Irish fans came back in a different colour what they went with. On to the main, the main event then itself, the 2002 World Cup. First game against Cameroon. I suppose, Marshall, it was a dream start for you, getting the goal and the equaliser. Yeah, I mean, it's um, great memories. And, um, you know, as a, as a kid growing up, you dream about playing at the highest level. And, and obviously the World Cup, it doesn't get much bigger, you know. Um, and and w to have that opportunity was was special. Um, it, it's funny because at half time, we, you know, we, we uh, the mantra going into it had been no regrets, and Mick had, had, had been saying that no regrets, no regrets, no regrets, and there was there was pinned up all over the walls um, signs saying no regrets, and and at, and at half time, that's pretty much all we had. And Mick did come in and say, you know, what what did I say to you? Um, you know, before the game, no regrets. And yet we haven't really turned up and we hadn't turned up particularly in that first half. Um, and uh, you know, second half, we did, we, we started much better. We were on the front foot. We were at them. Um, I actually think we, you know, fitness wise, we, we, we were pretty good as well because we, kept, we were the stronger team in the second half as well, which was, which was good. Um, and then the goal, of course, it's, um, you know what what dreams are made of to to score in a World Cup and an important one as well because we we couldn't afford to have got beaten in that first match, um, uh, you know as again from the edge of the box and it, yeah, the the Portugal one was a bit bit more hit and hope, uh, I, I suppose where I scored, the Estonia one I caught really cleanly, um, but this one was was just more of a a guided finish if you like the you know the pace was on the ball because it was coming to me um, and as I was running on to it I, I only had one thought in my mind and actually looking back at it you know you've got I think Robbie had made a good angle as well and you know I could have played Robbie in and uh, but as soon as it was coming at, at me I just was adjusting myself to get a shot away and um, 
Uh, and I just I just knew exactly where I was putting it, and I, I, it, it just felt like slow motion, really. When I hit the ball and and when it and when it sort of was on its way, I thought, well, that's got a chance. And and uh, as soon as it hits the net, well, you're away. And uh, what do you do? I mean, it, you've just scored in a World Cup. It's it's just you know I've got goosebumps talking about it now. Um, I I ran off to the right. I ran off to the right of the goal when I was celebrating and and sort of going mad. And and then I remembered where that before the game. My my wife and my dad and boys were in the crowd and I'd seen them because they'd had to get to the game really early. I think the, the bullet trainer got them really early and they were inside the ground. So I'd seen them as we were walking out, looking at the pitch before the match started. Um, so I knew exactly where they were. So I ran round the back of the goal and then you'll see it, you know, from the replays, I think uh, I've got Damien Duff and I've got Robbie all jumping on me, Kins, and, um and, and I'm sort of trying to shrug them off a little bit so I can sort of wave to my dad and my, and my wife and boys. And um, what I didn't realise until afterwards was that, that one of my sons was asleep because it had been such an early start. So he even missed the goal. Uh, my wife was drinking a, a, a Coke or something and, and threw it up in the air when I scored and covered everyone around her. Nobody cared because I, we, we'd equalised. Um, so it was a bit of a mad moment, really. Um, but And then, you, you know, and then it's sort of by the time you get back to the halfway line, it sinks in what you've done you know you think well i've scored but then your focus quickly changes again it's right can we go and win the game because we had still had plenty of time in the game it was over half an hour uh, over half an hour to go and we were in the ascendancy we we're on top so your focus changes to can we go and win the game didn't quite happen for us but i, I guess on on reflection it was a, it was a good point after such a poor first half hey gary you were at this tournament as well what's your memories from that game against cameroon was it one that we could have won in the end yeah, it's one. It was certainly, as Matt said, it was a game of two halves. I mean, we went in one down at half time and, and could have been could have been further behind. Came out, as you said, look, great goal, fantastic finish. Um, lots of drinks went everywhere, not just Coke when uh, <laughs> when we equalised. Um, yeah, I think Robbie hit the post late on. Yeah, we could have won it. And and the other thing to remember is Cameroon were a really good side at the time. They had actually won the two thousand Olympics. And they were also African Cup of Nations champions. They'd won that a few months earlier. So it pretty much they were the favourites with and with the Germans to, to come out of the group. So to not lose, to, to draw 1-1 one, one in the first game was certainly a great result. Yeah, we could have won it, um, could have lost it as well. And But it, it was certainly it was a great start to the campaign. Yeah, and we continue from there. 1-1 one, one draw against Germany, our next game. Robbie Keane scored that last minute equaliser. And then we secured our place in the knockout stages with a good 3-0 victory against Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Germany one, uh, my memory is actually of the Germany one. Um, uh, I remember before the game, I think it was cause, because it, I mean, I'm sure it was the Germany game. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Steve Staunton's 100th cap as well. Yeah. And um, Stephen Reid, who was the youngest member of the of the group, we, so we all chipped in and I think we bought a watch for, for Stan um, to commemorate his, his hundredth cap. And um, Stephen Reed did the speech in front of all the lads. And I was, I just remember being really impressed by Stephen Reed and, and his, um, his composure and the way he spoke for, for someone so young in, in the squad. Um, and that being a big moment that Stan was celebrating his hundredth cap. Um, so I remember that. And then in the game itself, I remember having a chance, um, almost a carbon copy of the of the goal against Cameroon as well, when the ball fell to me on the edge of the box and I, I it just went the wrong side of the post. I caught it, you know, quite well again, but just it, it virtually the same type of finish as well, but it just went the wrong side of the post. Um, but the Robbie goal, I mean, it it was brilliant, and the celebrations after that, you know, even watching it back now and mix sort of mix jumping onto the pitch and he's, he's a bit of a jig and and then he's jumping in the air and the celebrations from the whole bench down the touchline and everyone's on top of each other, um, celebrating with the fans behind the goal afterwards. It was just a, a, a brilliant, brilliant moment. Um, one I'll never forget. That that was uh, really special. I mean, it's, I, again, I thought we played really well in the game and, and, and you know, we deserved the draw. We de we deserved the draw. Absolutely deserved it. Um, but the celebrations just were were superb. But that was that was everyone together, and it was a really good moment. Yeah, George. Just kind of saying the Germany game. We did a watch back on that just a couple of weeks ago, and one of the stats that came up actually before the equaliser with the possession stats, and it was forty two fifty eight. So we'd fifty eight percent possession against the Germans. Yeah, Germany in a World Cup. 
a team that went on to reach the final. Uh, we had, we definitely deserved the draw. Oliver Kahn was actually outstanding that night. He was man of the match. Um, it wasn't anyone in an Irish shirt, but it was a great it was a great performance. And yeah, the goal came late, and yeah, the celebrations unbelievable. But it was fully deserved. That was a superb performance, and uh, we were more than a match for that German side. There's one mystery I have for that game, Matt, myself and a few of my mates are undecided of this: is who played the long ball into Niall Quinn to pick on. Go for you saying Mark Kinsa, go for you saying Steve Finnan. Do you have any know yourself so we can finally put this to end? Well, I, I'm 99.9% certain it was Steve Finnan. Yeah, well, I, it, was um, definitely, it was definitely Steve Finnan. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm 99% sure anyway it was Steve Finnan. He, he, uh, and obviously, you know, Quinny, Quinny won it. Um, there was quite a few, like, quite a few was trying to get on the second ball at that point. Um, and obviously, you know, Robbie, Robbie did the rest. Yeah, that sets up nicely then for the Saudi Arabia game. A good 3-0 victory there. And then on to Spain, around the 16. A daunting task, but we didn't look any bit out of place as we, as it's shown with the fact that it took a penalty shootout to decide it. Yeah, can we not talk about the, the penalty shootout? It was, um, it's amazing, isn't it? Our football, it's, no, it's amazing how football can throw up highs and lows. And, and throughout a career, generally, you can have more lows than you have highs, you know. And even even the top players will say that. Even the the players that are winning things year in year out, the, you know, Man United like Roy Keane and, and Ryan Giggs and people like that, you know, they'll say that there's a lot more lows than there are highs throughout a career. Um, and within the space of what two weeks, I've gone from being at the highest point, scoring in a World Cup and, and an important one, to the lowest, missing a penalty against Spain. Um, we've done we practice penalties you know, in the build up to it, of course we had, because you know, at some stage, you know, you, you feel as though that might be, they might be needed. Um, but there was no set five to take them, but we, we practiced them and, and we had gone through them. Um, and it was a case afterwards of, of who felt confident and Mick sort of looked around the lads and who, who wants one. And, you know, I, I felt confident. I, I, um, you know, I felt I was playing well uh, in the tournament and felt comfortable to, to take one um i'd made my mind up i mean in practice and I, I i've been i've been doing what I, I do really put my foot through the ball and hit it down the middle and that's what that's what i've been doing in practice and i've made my mind up that that's what i was going to do it was, i wasn't going to change my mind I, you know i didn't want to perhaps try and place it not get the right connection the power wasn't good enough the keeper made a comfortable save i wanted to make it difficult for the keeper i wanted to put my foot through it so i would made my mind up um, I can still I can still picture the walk up now and, and striking the ball and just getting too much of it. And um, I look back, I, I took I, so I wasn't a regular penalty taker. I wasn't someone that took, took penalties for my club. I, um, I I only took them ever really in in penalty shootouts. I took I took a penalty at Chelsea in a shootout. I took a penalty at Liverpool in a shootout. I actually took eight in total, um, and the only one I missed was that one. And that's the only one I've lasted. The other seven are placed. So if I've got any regret in my life, it's why didn't I place it? Why didn't I just try and you know, do what I'd done with, with previous penalties as well? Um, but, you know, at that time, the adrenaline's flowing. You, your mind's made up. I'm going to go down the middle. It was it was a horrible moment. Um, after the game, it, 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 myself and Robbie both got taken for the drugs test so we were we were taken straight off the tunnels we weren't even into the dressing room we literally off the pitch straight into the into the drugs testing room first thing that comes on in the drug testing room is is the penalty shootout i thought oh my god here we go i've got to watch that again and it took me sort of two and a half hours in there to provide a specimen as well the lads in fairness the, and, the, and the team all waited for myself and robbie to finish and, and get our job done and uh, before we they made our way back to the hotel that was brilliant otherwise you know we could have been going back on our, on our own back to the hotel um so yeah it was, you've gone from sort of the highest moment in your career to the very lowest and another quick story actually on on penalties because when i went back to ipswich we had a uh uefa cup game and it went to penalties early on in the season joe royal was the manager by then at ipswich and it went to a penalty shoot and a bit like the the one where I was saying, you know, there was no five designated penalties takers. It was after the game, Joe Rawl said, who wants to take one? And um, he looked around, he looked around and people were putting their hands up and he looked at me and I went, no, nah. I said, not after what happened in the summer. And he went, you're having the first one. And he sort of went, so he went around. The t so I had to take the first penalty. So anyway, took the first penalty and uh, scored. 
And as I walked into the dressing room after the game, we we won on penalties in this in this particular game. As I walked into the dressing room, he, he put his arm on my shoulder. He went, get back on the bike, son. Get back on the bike. You know, he said, you know, these things happen. It's not it's not great. Um, but but you've got to you've just got to put it to one side and, and get on with it and 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 you know do your stuff. So it was a really good piece of man management from him. And just going back again to the actual night. I'll never forget Kevin Kilban and, and his role in um, afterwards as well, because I was distraught. I was absolutely devastated after after missing that penalty uh, in tears on the phone to my wife in my room. And Kev came and knocked on the door and uh, he, he sort of said, you know, what are you doing? I said, he said, we're all going to go have a few beers. And and I said, no, I said, I'm going to stay here. I'm, I'm devastated. Can't can't go out. Can't face it. He went, no, no, no. Come on. Uh, you, it, we're all going out. Everyone's going. You're coming. Let's do it. And um, it, it was it was a great night. So I've got I've got him to thank for having a having a good night after it. But it was it was yeah uh, one of the highest moments in your career, down to the lowest in the space of two weeks. Yeah, that's just really how life in football goes. But some lovely touches there from Joe Roy and Kevin Clavan to help you get over all the disappointment moments, as we all know ourselves, Gary. Like we all know what happened before that tournament, Gary. The whole Roy Keane instant but the general feeling of from the team was still in a really good place after that 2002 world cup and confidence and hopes were high on making your 2004 but it got off to a disastrous start and that kind of ultimately was the end for mick mccarthy and gary yeah so we we cared certainly the fans i suppose we went to the world cup with low enough expectations given what happened but yeah we came off on a great high we drawn with spain drawn with germany and drawn with Cameroon beating Saudis, um, beat Finland. I think, if I remember correctly, in a in a friendly uh, the, the following August, a very comfortable win away from home, a rare away friendly, even in those days. And we travelled to Moscow, and I know normally going to Moscow, you're kind of expecting to to get beaten, but we were actually favourites. I'm pretty sure to win that game, and yeah, a very disappointing uh, defensive performance. Conceded, beaten four two, scored a couple of goals, and caused them problems, but lost the game, and uh, and and then came up with a home tie against Switzerland, which almost ended or effectively did end, I suppose, our, our hopes of going through a, a bitterly disappointing defeat at home by Switzerland. Um, we we never played that that day, and. Uh, Unfortunately, that was the end of, of mixed rain. Yeah, that Euro 2004 qualifying campaign, Matt, was a funny one. As you mentioned, the change over manager, and everyone kind of thought after Russia, Switzerland defeats that our hopes were going to be quite limited. But as it turned out, Albania and Georgia started taking points off Switzerland and Russia, and the group started opening up. We got a couple of wins under new manager Brian Kerr, and we found ourselves still in with a chance of qualifying going into the last game against Switzerland, but unfortunately, it ended up in disappointment. Yeah, I, I mean, I. Just just going back onto those first two games of that that tournament, and obviously they didn't go well, and we didn't play well. You know, people say hangover from the World Cup, and, and maybe there was, you know, after what had happened uh, in the summer. Um, I was surprised that that Mick went, to be honest, at that particular time. You know, I, th- I felt like he had a fair bit of credit in the bank with what he'd achieved and, and where he was at at that particular time. So I was a bit surprised that he decided that after just two games like that and he decided to to um to to obviously leave his position um brian came in and actually i think i think he's he's um his first game in charge i think he gave me the armband which was a you know a really good moment for me against scotland um i'm pretty sure that was his first game yeah. and yeah, yeah it was his first game yeah. yeah and and he gave me, he gave me the captaincy as well so that's always nice you know when you you know a new man comes in and he's he's got faith in you to to make you captain as well he, that's you know, good from a personal point of view. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, the campaign was a funny one, really. We, 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 it was off to the worst possible start. and We did claw our way back into it. Um, but ultimately, um, didn't it didn't quite happen for us. And we, uh, we I, I don't think we played very well in, in Switzerland, uh, away from home. Um, but if memory serves me particularly true, I, I don't think we played very well. And we, we deservedly got beaten that that, that day. Despite obviously that campaign being disappointment, we did really kind of pick things up and didn't really seem to affect us because in 2004 we had some unbelievable friendly results. We drew with Brazil, we bet Czech Republic, we bet Croatia, we bet Romania as one little home as well, which you scored in, in Roy Keane's return. And obviously then that fantastic victory against Holland. So we were in a fantastic place going into the World Cup qualifiers for 2006. 
yeah and, and obviously Roy coming back as well was it was a big thing um you know everyone knows what a quality player he is so him coming back was a big one um that Dutch team again. I mean, I, I, I looked at the uh, the teams for that game the other day, actually, um, and the side that they had, um, the Dutch in that that friendly, um, was was unbelievable. It was um, uh, such a quality team, and and we we managed to win the game as well. I think Robbie scored a worldie. Actually, Robbie scored a twenty five yarder in, in that one. Um, but yeah, we if we um, I felt we were in a good place really going going into those um, into into those games. Um, so yeah, we, we we were in a good place, especially with Roy coming back as well. Yeah, good pub quick question for a year to come is who scored the winning goal on Roy Keane's return in Ireland shirt? I'm sure you'll be ready to answer. Yeah, and I'll know the answer anyway. Uh, uh, Craig said that was your last goal as well for Ireland. It was, yeah. Yeah, it was. It was um yeah, again, it was another volley actually. I think Robbie was gonna head it. I think he, I think he I, I got a shout off me at the last minute and decided to sort of duck out of it. And um keeper got a hand on it, maybe should have saved it, but um, nice to see it going. The 2006 qualifying campaign, Gary, without repeating myself, this was such a funny campaign and we were so unlucky. Every game between ourselves, France, Switzerland and Israel was a draw except for Henri's wonder winner at Lansdowne Road. We finished fourth with 17 points, three points behind France, point behind Switzerland for the playoffs. It really was a campaign that was so unlucky and obviously everyone's going to think back to those two games against Israel. Yeah, Jerry. I I think it's really a frustrating and disappointing campaign because it started so well. I mean, Matt had mentioned we had played very badly in Basel in two thousand and three. It just the team didn't seem up. For, I don't know what what was wrong, but it just didn't work out. Went back there. I think starting. I know we had the Faroes and Cyprus. Not, but our first uh, proper game was away to Switzerland in September of four. The start of the campaign. Got a great draw. Um, I think Clinton Morrison scored early for us, but very good, well-deserved 1-1 one, one point, 1-1 one, one draw. Following month, went to Paris and uh, France away. And, I mean, they don't come much tougher than that. We played really, really well. We drew nil, nil all. Uh, John O'Shea could have won it. A fantastic effort to just shave the post. But fantastic point. So we played the two big teams in the group and both away from home. And just like in the 2002 campaign, we had got two very good points. And, yeah, we were totally set up. I think we'd beaten Cyprus, and he was the Pharaohs we'd beaten at home in that September and October. And yeah, so th then there was the break until March uh, 2005. And, uh, yeah, I think France had started a bit slowly in Switzerland. They, they both dropped points, but we... We, we should have beaten Israel. We went over there. We were one nil up. We were the by far the better side, and uh, unfortunately, we decided to sit back with about ten minutes to go. And it, it was still an incredible goal. I think their player put it in from about thirty yards. But um, oh, it's so frustrating because that that was a game we we had won effectively and gave it away in the ninetieth ninetieth minute. Yeah, Abba Suen got the equalising goal for Israel that night in Israel. That was actually the only goal for Israel. And to make it worse, well, one of the players who scored two goals in the last game. Matt, that qualifying campaign was your last in a green shirt. Looking back on it, is it one that you feel that we should have at least made the playoff because we certainly had enough quality? Yeah, it got away from us, really. That one, it, it definitely got away from us. We had some good results along the way. Uh, there was some strange results along the way. The Israel one was the one that stands out. Um, and I remember that game because um, just before it, my wife had had a bad accident on a, on um, falling off a horse and she'd, she'd had a plate and pins put in her leg. Um, she she had a, a four or five pins and a plate put in her leg, which, which she'd broken. And... Um, I travelled to Israel, but then missed the because I think we played China just after it in a friendly, uh, and I missed the China game to get back to see her. But I, I went to Israel to, to to be involved in the friendly and uh, to the, the qualifier. Sorry, so I remember that one. But that was the one that got away from us really. And you, you do look back, and you know you think some of the near misses. Um, you know, we, right at the start of this conversation, Macedonia, um, and then that one as well. There was a, there was a, you know. There's always those. I told you. I told you through a career. There's there's more lows than there are highs. And um, for all the for all the great moments, for all the great ones, you always look back and think, what if? And what about that game? And what about that game? You're always you know analyzing things and and what could have been better. And um, 
yeah, it was it was a campaign that got away. I think. I know he retired after that campaign, but like as I touched on, I think just first myself that Brian Kerr was really unlucky and like a lot of them games we should have won and we played quite well, especially early on that campaign. Like Mick McCarthy got three qualifying campaigns. Do you think Brian should have got another goal? I kind of feel he should have. Yeah, maybe. I mean, you know, he, Brian was a good manager and he, and he obviously had a, a good rapport with some of the, the lads who he, you know, coached at underage level as well and knew knew what they were all about as well. And, and I, you know, I enjoyed it. I always enjoyed his company. Um, yeah, you know, and I think he did a, you know, did a decent job. And unfortunately, you'd say it's just fine margins in games and in, in, in certain, you know, times throughout a qualifying campaign that perhaps can go against you and and yeah maybe maybe he did deserve a, another crack at it what would you think yourself gary yeah i i don't know Ger. i am I, I think part of the issue became that when the the two israel games because the other one the home game was one i know a lot of fans will remember as well we were tuning it up and cruising and ended up drawing that two two uh I think Brian was a great manager. He's done a fantastic job in the League of Ireland, and he had he had a great start to the campaign. As I said, uh, unfortunately, it became. I remember it becoming very negative in the press at the time, and uh, I think Brian withdrew from the media. And when he didn't give them something to write about, they had to write about him. And unfortunately, it became. Uh, I think the the fans turned on him a bit as well. Unfortunately. Yeah, it is because I mean he was one of the best, arguably one of the best managers ever in the League of Ireland, and he had done a fantastic job. But as Matt said, with a lot of those players winning the the, the under under sixteens and under eighteens in the late nineties, so yeah, he had he had done so well. Um, so he probably did deserve another campaign, but unfortunately, it had become really negative the latter half. Uh, those two Israel performances and results, I think uh, he he took the blame for them. I don't so much mind the France game. That was a, a brilliant strike from Henri. Um, Switzerland at home, we still could have beaten could have beaten them, but uh, we drew nil nil. Could have earned a playoff. They ended up qualifying for the World Cup as well as France. But um, yeah, so I, I'm sure he feels himself. He deserves another campaign, but. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, it was not to be. It was. It was definitely one that got away. Yeah, then to see France, who were so close in that group one to reach the final, and even Switzerland, which the last sixteen of that campaign really made you think that we weren't that far away. Just finally, Matt, just before we finish up, we hear so many great stories about what your eighty-eight, Italia ninety, USA ninety-four done for this country and the scenes and what it meant to so many of these people that born in Ireland. But for people who are living outside of Ireland or born outside of Ireland that came from an Irish background, what does it mean to you looking at them moments? Absolutely love them. I absolutely love them. I mean, you know, during this lockdown period, it's um, it's coincided with a lot of the anniversaries of these big moments through Irish history. And um, it's been brilliant on social media to be able to sort of see them, hear about them, listen to them, listen to the stories about them. Um, you know, I, I, some of the messages is I've got through through this this um, this last month or so of um, you know what that what people were doing when I scored against Cameroon and um, it's just it's just fabulous to to be able to relive it to be able to talk about it to, to be able to listen to what you know people are you know saying about what happened and um, and see it from all different perspectives as well you know i i love now being able to go to games and and, and follow the you know the irish team myself and, and sam and son we went out to um uh where did we go we went to denmark last last summer um to, to watch the qualifier and we got that late equalizer shane duffy scoring um it, being able to go as a pundit and being able to watch the games it's just it's just always brilliant to to meet with the fans talk to the fans um and get different perspectives of it all really but um yeah it's been really good actually the last month or so reliving some of those anniversaries and and um, it's been nice to be able to get some of the messages and people talking about what they were doing when i when i scored against cameroon it's it's been good yeah i remember like yesterday's a six-year-old child getting up early in the morning to watch it. don't make me feel old <laughs> <laughs> I myself feel a bit old now too as well. uh gary anything you want to ask matt yourself no, I just to, to thank him for everything he's done in a green shirt and uh, so, given us so many special moments. And in particular, I remember those those goals in Nagata and in Lisbon that were just so, so important and, and meant so much 
to so many of us. Yeah, some great memories there for Mick McCarthy's first time and Brian Kerr. And obviously the standout memory was that summer of 2002 when we got to the last 16 of the World Cup. That's where we're going to leave it for now here on Irish Football Fan TV. Uh, it's a great pleasure having former Ireland player Matt Holland on and hopefully we'll hear from him again more on the channel. No, thank you very much for having me on. Um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure to relive it again. Um, I hope you're keeping safe and well. And everyone watching, I hope you're keeping safe and well as well. And hopefully we're back at games pretty soon. Same yourself, Matt. Hopefully we will get back to a bit more normality over the coming months. As I mentioned, that's where we're going to leave it for now. Uh, plenty more videos come up on Irish Football Fan TV. Head over to our YouTube channel where you'll find loads of them and, and keep yourself very much updated with great content. So that's where we're going to leave it for now. Thanks very much for watching.